Statistics, confidence intervals, binomial distribution, survey example number two. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But... But that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunchy numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. We're currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1974 confidence interval binomial distribution survey example number two tab. Looking at a situation similar to recent scenarios, except this time, once again, we have a binomial situation for confidence intervals by meaning two, which we we will get back to shortly. Also, this time we're going to have the binomial situation on a higher percentage on the yeses uh, versus the no, as we will see shortly. But similar to recent scenarios in that we're trying to find information about a large population. We can't, of course, test every item within that population. Therefore, we're going to do our good old strategy of taking a sample, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. There are two methods for doing this, typically one being the confidence intervals, two being the hypothesis testing. The hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we think we know what that middle point is, such as as if the bag of peanuts says on average there are so many peanuts in the bag, then we can make our graph around that center point, around the hypothesis, then take the sample to see whether or not the sample is far enough away for us to make the assumption that we want to reject the original hypothesis. With confidence intervals, it lends itself to situations where we might not know what that middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. Therefore, we're going to have to take the sample and get the average or middle point of the sample that we construct a range around. And that range could be based on hypothesis testing in that if this was the amount that we found from our sample, we could assume what if the hypothesis was way over here, the middle point over here. If I was to build a graph over here, is the result I got from the sample far enough away for me to reject that hypothesis, asking that hypothesized question for every point, and then we would get a range from like peak to peak, and we would be looking at like the middle of it. But it would be easier if we could just take that middle point and put a graph around it, such as a bell-shaped curve for a normal distribution, or if we couldn't use a normal distribution, possibly T distributions, which is what we will basically look at at this point in time. With a normal distribution, then typically you have like 95% of the data could be in the middle point around two standard deviations on each side of that. Uh, would be encompassing that 95%. And then in the tails, uh, you can have like the 5% on the tails, 2.5 on each side of the tails. Remembering that we can see this graph in terms of Z scores. If we're talking about a normal curve, T scores, if it was a T distribution, the middle point being zero that we can count up in terms of standard deviations or spread, or we can measure it in terms of X's which we will see as we go. All right, so we have a binomial distribution situation. That's going to mean that we only have two choices per result. So if we had some data that was not binomial, such as if we were looking at heights or we're looking at weights of people, or if we took a survey and we were saying, give me a result of one to five or one to 10, then they could give a result that's going to be one through 10. 
not binomial. But if your survey is restricted to say, I want you to just give me a yes or no, did you like it or did you not like it, then you can only have two results. A coin flip would only have two results per test. A, a election where you say, are you voting for A or B? Or possibly, are you voting for this candidate or not voting for this candidate? Are examples of only having basically two options. So that's what we're going to do here. We're, we're going to say the question this time is a survey situation. And we're going to say survey to see uh, if customers like the anime crunchy rule. So we're looking at, again, these platforms. So the, the asking if they like what they're watching or not. And we imagine, obviously, we did examples before all the main platforms out there. And the responses we got were, of course, no, they're terrible. The stuff they're making these days are terrible. I like the platform because I'm watching stuff on it that was made like in the 80s and the 90s. But all the new stuff is like, I feel like I'm being like, it's almost like propaganda for crying out loud. So, but the anime, which I don't have a lot of experience with, but the anime platform, as far as I could tell, I don't feel like I'm being preached to here on, on it, even though they have funny hair and their eyes keep on bulging out and whatnot. But at least, and maybe I just don't know like the political stuff in Japan, maybe. So I just don't, I'm not aware that they're preaching at me to something, but I, 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 uh, I think it's better. So that's going to be the idea, right? So we took, we take a survey. Did you like it or did you not like it? And I just made up these numbers, right? But I'm going to assume we're going to say that the popular, I feel like this is like more pretty, pretty close to accurate based on what I'm looking at these days. Whereas like, we're going to say like 85% are saying, yeah, it's good versus the the 15% we're going to say no not good. Now obviously that's completely reversed to all the other movies and and like platforms and stuff that are out there everywhere else because because it was it was terrible as we saw before uh with them. So that's pretty good given these days. That's going to be the what we're imagining the actual data is. Uh so this is like I say in conjunction with this kind of storytelling platforms that we're thinking about. This is the behind the scenes stuff, the stuff that we know as the viewer, but they don't know it in universe, the actual results being, or the actual population, 85% liking it, 15% not liking it. That of course adds up to 100%. Now the first question we're gonna ask is, well, how can we generate our data so that so that we have a breakout such as that so that we can then take a sample from that data now this is like a logistical kind of question within excel uh, that we could ask which we do do this in excel in another course or section but those are going to be longer presentations i'll give you a general idea of it at this point in time and some techniques that we might be able to use uh, one is that i could use a random number generation tool and say, I would like to, to generate random numbers between, say, 1 and 10. And then I'm just going to assign numbers 1 through 85. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1 through 8 about, right? 85 is going to be more, a little bit more difficult, right? Because 85. But 1 through 8, if I wanted 80% versus uh, are going to be yeses. And then the, the 9 and the 10 would be noes. Right, that wouldn't be exactly the 85, uh, 15. It'd be 80, 20. But you can you could use a similar method, some something like that. Another method that we could use is we could say, let me just populate our data. Now I'm gonna make I'm gonna imagine that we're gonna make a thousand count of our population. Now in practice, probably the people using the platform is way more than that. But I want to approximate a fairly large data set that we could make in Excel and then take a sample from it so that we can imagine and have an understanding of the full population data set that we're using as well as the sample that we're taking from it. Therefore, the full population we're going to say is 1,000. Now, if I was going to say 8515 is the breakout of people liking it to not liking it, then I could say, well, 85% of 1,000 is 850. 15% of 1,000 is 150. So all I'm going to do is then say, copy down the yeses, people that like it, to 180 or 850 lines. And then the last uh, 150, I will copy the nose. So now it's in order 
this would be like having our population data that has now been shuffled in order. Then the question is, well, how can I randomly shuffle it so I can simulate taking a sample of that data, which will be reflective of what we would be doing in practice when we sample a certain amount of people of the population to see if they like it or not. So one way is we could generate random numbers. This would just be with a rand function, which gives us a long decimal of numbers of which we can only see four at this time. And then if I connect all of these together with a table, I can just shuffle it like a deck of cards and then I should get the random numbers. The other way I could do it is I could say, I'll keep it unshuffled, but I'll, I'll do a random uh, number generation from it. Now, this is just a recap of the, of the, of the data we counted. If I count these, I'm using a count a function instead of just a count function because I'm counting things that don't have numbers in it. I think the A in Excel stands for alphabet. There's 1000 of them. And then we're counting the yeses. So I'm gonna say count if, and then I selected all these. And then if it's a yes, meaning I said select the cell, if you see that yes, and we found that there's 850, so we double checked it, that looks good. And I could do the same thing, count if there's a no, we get the 150, 150 plus 850 adds up to 1000. So that's our actual data. So then, then I'm gonna mirror the sample. This is what we know actually in universe, meaning I'm gonna take the sample, I'll take it with this formula, this would be just Excel, taking an index, an index of this column, the yeses and nos, which are in order over here, but then I wanna take a random between function and these represent the rows between row number one and row number 1000. And that should return our random number generation that we have here. Once we have those numbers, then we can start to do our, our calculations. So now we can say, all right, uh, let's just break this thing out. We're going to say first the the S, the sample count. So this will just be a count function. How many did we take? I'm doing a count A again instead of just a count because these are, are not numbers. And we have a sample of 100. So our population is 1,000. That would be large N. Uh, the, the sample count is going to be... Uh, one, 100, which probably should have been N instead of S. I don't know why I put an S there. Uh, I usually put an N there. That's the tech normal <laughs> abbreviation for it. So P, count and percent. So of the count that we have, how many of them are going to be yeses? Now note, there's only two possible results we can have, a yes uh, and a no. So if they were a result of one through 10, if we said, hey, look, tell us how, how much you liked it on a one through 10 scale, then we would have actual numbers that we could basically add up and we can take the mean to give us the average. If it's just two, I can't get a mean, it's just gonna be yes or no. So what, I'm gonna, what we're gonna do then, and the binomial is to say, I'm looking at the yeses as the, the, my perspective. What are the percentage of yeses? And so I'm gonna go through here and count all of the yeses. So if I say a count, I'm gonna say count if is the formula of this range. Count if you see a yes, it returns 85 of them. Now, if there's only 100 uh, items, I know that the nose is gonna be 100 minus 85 or 15. Now. I would rather do a formula, however, to double check that in Excel. So I would do another formula in here and say equals this column again, same formula. Uh, I'm sorry, count if this column, if you see a no and we get 15. And of course the yeses and the nos add up to 1000, which is a double check because we know that this should be in the whole thing was uh, one, 100, not 1000, right? So we can get our percentages. So if 85 out of a thousand, that's 85%, of course, and then 15 divided by or out of one th or 100, keep on getting 100, that's gonna be the 15%. So here's our percent breakout and the percent breakout is similar to what we would be using as the mean, which would be taking the average 
if we took a sample or if we the survey, for example, was between one and 10, in which case we would take the average count to see if it comes out to like a, well, I think we did that before on the other platforms and we got like a three, right? Because we weren't doing crunchy rule. We were doing all the other movies, platforms and stuff and they're all lame. So we had like a three, but this one, but this one, we, we just did the yes or no's. So this would be kind of the equivalent to the average from the perspective of the one we picked, which is the yes, which means that one minus P are going to be the no's. Okay. So then we can get the, the P bar or mean, like I say, is just going to be that 85. And so then the level of confidence, notice we kicked it up a notch level of confidence by default is is often set at 95. We put it up to 99, which means we're kicking up the confidence level here. So if I look at the graph, we're saying, okay, the default, the orange bit is often set at 95, which is usually two standard deviations about away. But now it's going up to 99. So that means what that means is that the confidence interval is going to have to be larger to accommodate a larger level of confidence, which gives us less specificity, but uh, allows for a larger level of confidence. So that's gonna be the trade-off. And that means that these tail bits, if there's 99% in the middle under the curve, then the tails are gonna have 1% on the end. And because it's symmetrical, each tail is gonna have one divided by two or 0.05%. So alpha is gonna be one minus 99 is one. And then uh, A divided by two is 0.5%. Now remember that the 99% is something that's going to be, we determine it. We determine what the confidence level is gonna be. And so just by random chance alone, then we should get, if everything else was proper or good, 99% of our results about to be within our interval. But 1% of the time, it's going to be outside of the interval. That's going to be the idea. So then we can calculate our Z's. So the Z uh, represents uh, our, our X factor on our graph in terms of standard deviations. So I'm looking at, so if I take, this is going to be the norm.disc calculation in Excel. It's, I'm sorry, norm.s.inverse dot dot calculation in Excel. And then I'm looking at the probability which is gonna be that 0.5, but I want the higher Z. So I'm looking at one, which is 100%, right? Minus that 0.5%, which gives us the 2.575. So what does that mean? Let's go over here do, 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 and see out here, there's the 2.57 about right there at that limit. So we're saying this, this amount could be measured and notice I have X's and I have in Z's. Z's represent the standard deviations. So remember that if it was if it was 95% in the middle, around almost two standard deviations away would be the Z's from the middle point, which would be a Z of zero. But now it's going to be larger that we had two point around five seven or so to get up to here because 99% has to be in the middle in terms of the standard deviations. Also note that if I didn't say one minus, it would have given me this bit, a negative number over here, uh, a negative 2.57 about or whatever it was. And that's why we wanted the upper bit. So that's why we took one minus to get the upper bit because it usually measures from left to right. This stuff goes from left to right when the Excel functions are put in place. All right, so then we have the standard error. Now, you, we will recall that when we look at our data, uh, uh, we have the standard deviation is measures the spread. So to get our bell curve, there's two things we need. We need the middle point, the mean, and we need the standard deviation. Now, notice in our actual sample here, our sample data isn't going to be bell-shaped because it's a binomial distribution. There's only going to, if we were to make a histogram of it, it would only have two bars, which you can't really make a bell shaped from. So we could still get the standard deviation in essence of the data if we were gonna uh, put the data as ones and zeros or something like that to get a measure of the spread. But that's not the standard deviation we're looking to in order to create the bell shape because we're, what we're trying to consider is the standard deviation as though we took 
every combination of sample of whatever sample size, in our case, 100 of the 1000. And we're going to represent that concept, not by actually doing that because we don't, because that would be very almost impossible to do, but we're going to do that with our formula that we have derived in prior presentations. So we have the standard deviation of the actual data, which could be mirrored if we were to take like the standard deviation of the sample. But what we really want is the standard deviation of that concept of all possible combinations, uh, average of all samples or the mean of all samples or the P's of all samples of every combination of 100 samples. That's the data that we're building our graph on over here. And we get that with our formula. Now this formula, we're just looking at this bit because this side is giving us kind of like the range. So we're looking at everything, the square root part over here. You will recall that this calculation, if it was not binomial, if it wasn't just two, uh, if it was like a, a survey of 10 out of 10 or something, then we took the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of N, which should be the sample size, which for some reason we put S on our thing, right? Uh, uh, and if we didn't know the standard deviation of the population, then we would approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of N. But because it's binomial, we have a slightly different formula, which is gonna be the whole thing is under the square root of P, which is gonna be representing the percentage of the factor that we're looking at in our case, the percentage of yeses, times one minus P, which is the other half or the other part, which is 100% minus P or one minus P. And then that's gonna be divided by N, which once again is the sample size. All of that is under the square root. So that calculation looks like this in a, in a formula, the square root of, and then we're taking the P, which is in percent, 0.85 or 85%, uh, times one minus P, which we've already calculated at the 15%. So that'd be 100 minus the 85, 15% divided by the N, which this should be N instead of an S, the 100, all of that's in the square root. That gives us the 0 0.0357. All right, so given that, we can then calculate the margin of uh, error. The margin of error in terms of Xs, you will recall that if the middle point is is the middle P that we that we got. And then we're looking at the margin. We saw the margin in terms of Z's. Now I wanna calculate the margin in terms of uh, X's. So we're gonna say, all right, if, if the standard deviation, each standard deviation is 2.5, oh, wait a sec, each standard deviation is this 0 0.0357 and we, we're gonna go each of, and we're going to go 2.5758 out. So we're going to say times the 2.2.5758. So now we get to the 0 0.0920. So that means that if we, if we start at our center point, 85.85, we'll do it in decimals. And we'll say that now we're going to say minus this margin of error, 0 0.092. That gives us the 75.8% about if we percentify it. And then we got the upper middle point, 0.85 plus this margin, 0 0.0992, 94.2. So that means in our graph, I could say the middle point in terms of Z's will be standard deviations. The middle point will be zero. And then to, to encompass 99% in Z's, we would have to go up not about two, not about 1.96 or whatever on both sides, but rather 2.57 because we have to go further distance to get the higher 99 versus the 95. Or we can measure that same kind of distance in X's. The middle point would be 85 and the, the upper point or the lower point would be 75.8 and the upper point uh, 74.2. So let's look at those two, 75 and uh, 94 and 85. So 85 is in the middle. Boom, if 85 right here and zero Z. And then on the lower, it was like 74 or something like that, right over here, which was like the negative 2.5 something Z's. And then in the upper, 
we're going up to the uh, 94 or so and the 2.57 or so on the positive to get 99% under the curve in the middle to get the remaining 1% in the outer ends. Each end, because it's symmetrical, is the 1% divided by 2, which is the 0.05% uh, on the tails. All right, if we graph this then, I'm going to make my graphs this way. I'm going to measure NZs. Why did I go negative 4? I'm going to go negative 4 up to positive 4. Because if I look at the thing in terms of Zs, the zero Zs are in the middle. If it was a normal distribution, about 95% of the data would be in like two standard deviations. If you go four standard deviations out, that's way out. And that means all of the, that should give you enough information to graph everything in the graph, even though in theory it goes on forever. So I'm going to go out four standard deviations in each direction and then calculate my Xs based on that. And so if I say four standard deviations out, how do I calculate the X? Well, the standard deviations can be measured in X's in terms of standard error. So that's going to be the uh, 0.0357. There's four of them times four, negative four. And that would be this, this number. And then I'm going to take that uh, minus the middle point, 0.85. And that's going to give us our 70.72. I can do that all the way down, copying that formula down. And that would give us our X's all the way down. And then we can do our norm.dist calculation to give us our percentages. Norm.dist of this X comma the mean, which is the middle point or the P, 85%. And then the standard deviation which is the standard error in our case. And then the the cumulative, no, we don't want it to be cumulative, therefore zero. There's our percentages. So that would give us the whole middle part of the graph. But I also want to graph the tail bits here and add not only the X's, X factor for the X's, but also the Z's down here. So to do that, I'm going to make another graph on top of it. And I'm going to be graphing the middle point, the orange bit. And so if I graph the orange bit, I can do that two ways. I could say, I want you to give me the information uh, if there's a Z greater than negative 2.5758 and less than a positive 2.5758. That would be the middle part of the graph. Or I can do it in X's which I believe I did, which is to say, I want the X's, give me a result of all X's if the X is greater than 75.8 and if the X is less than 94. So that's what we did here. The, the X has to be greater than the 76 and less than the 94. Here's the formula. It's a logic formula. So it's an if function. There's two logic tests. Therefore, within the if function, we embedded an and function of the two logic tests. The logic test being x has to be greater than 0.76. x has to be less than the 0.94. Closing up the and function back to the if function. What do we want to do if both those logic tests are true? We want you to give me this x right here, that percent. If it's not true, what it wants you to do, leave it blank. As you can see, it's been left blank. It's not exactly blank because it has a space in it, which is indicated by the text field under the quotes. So you can't see it's actually populating the middle point, but I didn't copy it all the way down. But it's, it's populating the middle part of the graph and not the tails of the graph. So now I have, in essence, two graphs on top of each other. One behind, the blue one's behind, and this one, the middle part, is on top. That's the idea. Okay, and that allows me to also apply a second x-axis. So the end result here is that we get our graph. The middle part or the orange part of the graph represents 99% under the curve. The blue part is the 1%, which each tail is 1 divided by 2 or 0.05%. We have can measure these points, as we saw before, in either x's or z's. Z's representing the standard deviations, zero at the middle. And we go further than two standard deviations on each side because of the fact that we want more than 95%, 0.0, .0 0.0, 0 
we want 99% confidence in the middle. And we can also measure in terms of X's on both sides as we saw as well. Okay, so if I go back on over here, uh, just noting that if if we compare what we actually got to the, the calculation over here, we said the actual data should have 85%. That's how many people actually like uh, the crunchy the, the, the crunchy rule. So we said that that was 85. And the result that we got is actually right there. Now it's probably averaged, uh, but our sample is right there. So, so of course our range does encompass the 80 uh the 85 percent between 75 and 94. now if i was to reshuffle this number which in excel we can do because i i made a random generation that is reshuffleable and i keep on shuffling it then there will be one percent of the time we would expect one time out of a hundred shuffles about on average that the that the the result that we get this result or this range doesn't encompass the actual number of 85%, right? The, we're going to get a range that doesn't include the actual mean on on average 1% of the time out of uh out of 100% of the time. That's what it means to be 99, which is a uh, fairly high confidence level, of course. Now, if we lower that confidence level from 99 to 95, then we're going to run the risk just by chance alone that that we have a range that does not encompass the actual number but we're going to get a range that's a little bit tighter a little bit more specific so that's going to be the trade-off of course that we have between those those two things do we want a tighter more specific number in that case we have to accept more risk that the actual mean doesn't fall within it or do we want more confidence which means we have to widen the range uh, and have a less specific range in order to achieve the greater level of confidence. So the bottom line is, you know, I, the crunchy, the anime thing is a little crazy. They got crazy hair, their eyes bulge out and stuff, you know, so there's some weird stuff on it, you know, but I don't feel like there's like as much activism stuff. I think that's what's being resulted in the numbers here. People are like, dude, I don't feel like I'm being preached. I'm like watching the thing and like, dude, they're trying to brainwash me here, here, and here. So it's like, that's all. And then, then, and then that's, and you have to like deal with that while you're watching. I don't feel like that's the case. Um, and I think that's one of the major takeaways from the numbers we're seeing here that the that our platforms around here, you know, could probably could probably learn. I think what they're doing over there is actually taking good, you know, some of the time. They're taking like good like manga, which are like comic books, and then making them into like a like a movie type thing on the anime. But they're not changing like they don't change the story in from like the comic book manga thing, uh, which kind of makes sense because the comic book manga thing like sold a bunch of copies, which is why they turned it into the the anime in the first place, right? And and what we keep like what the other people keep doing is they take the popular like comic book thing and then they make it into like a movie or something but they change it and they can't and that's the, and but they don't know like they don't know how to write and so like even though they have cool stuff happening and stuff blows up and stuff the they they mess up the whole story and so this is i think this is the takeaway from the numbers.